This program was first broadcast on Canterbury's access media station, Plains FM, and was made with the assistance of New Zealand On Air. Welcome to Breaking Ground, a podcast about earth moving machinery and characters in the industry. Both your hosts work for Terra Cat, New Zealand's Caterpillar machinery dealer. I'm Richard Clark. And I'm Marty Terek. In this podcast, we hear from a wide range of people. And today we're introducing Dan Goodman. Dan is a director of Goodman Contractors based in Waikanae, north of Wellington. Goodmans have been shifting dirt since 1963, and Rip Goodman and his brother Tony started the business. Since then, Goodmans have been involved in many iconic projects that have helped shape New Zealand, and there's been plenty of big earth-moving machinery used along the way. We'll get into some of those with our session today. Welcome, Stan. Oh, good afternoon. How's everyone? Yeah, very well, thanks. Good, good. So, Stan... um, Goodmans have a, a long history in New Zealand, so you, what's the, the first project you remember being involved with? Well, um, as a young fella, I grew up in Mangaweka. We uh, we moved to Mangaweka where Dad took on, um, it was a re, realignment of the main trunk line, and um, I always remember Dad saying it was a million cubes for a million dollars, a uh, million cu- cubic yards it was in those days, and um, uh, Lance and I, we were... We were uh, five and six years old and um, spent numerous t- uh, days on the old go-kart going up and down the hall road. In fact, we got stuck on the hall road one day and um, never forgot that because uh, we got a telling off of our lives for being out on the hall road. But, uh, yeah, that was that was the one that stuck out the most. But uh, as um, able to operate, um, I was 15 uh, when the electrification was happening, the main trunk electrification, and um, so I... Uh, all school holidays uh, was on a motor scraper uh, on the rail, so that was um, that was a significant project for for me to remember. Yeah. So it sort of sounds like you started very young, obviously six years old, not necessarily uh, helping with the project, but sort of by fifteen, you're sort of definitely getting involved. Yeah. So, yep. what are some of the largest projects? That, I mean, the electrification sounds like a large project in itself, but. There must be some really large projects, and what sort of highlight for you and why? Oh, um, the highlight for us um, has to be Macquarie's to Pika Pika. Um, we're, 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 we're um, just under five million cubes on that job, and um, that was an awesome project to be involved in. Um, right on our back door, and um, sort of allowed us to grow. So um, that was really significant and. Just an enjoyable job, you know. Uh, Fletchers were great to work with, Beckers, um, and some real key people that um, really knew how to get a job going. You know, it was great. Yep. Tell us a wee bit more about that um, that project for, I suppose, a few people who maybe not be so aware of it. Yeah. Um, well, well, I was lucky enough to get involved. Uh, Bernard Higgins got me involved right at the start, and um, so it was an alliance project, and... Um, Basically, we didn't have to price it. We just had to put our best foot forward, and uh, and we did that. And fortunately, we we beat um, uh, there was two other uh, consortiums, and, and we came out on top. And uh, so that was great. That was, I think, that was Easter, about two thousand and eleven, or it might have been two thousand and ten. And it basically took three years of planning uh, because it didn't even have the the land uh, sorted or anything and the consents. So we were involved in the design and um, the methodology of how we were going to shift the dirt. But but basically, most of the dirt was there. We just had to rearrange it. So the, the peat had to come out and uh, the sand had to be borrowed and put in the hole. And then the peat got put back and turned into a sand hill, which um, the council said we couldn't do it. And I said, well, we can. We'll make it look like a sand hill again. You won't even know. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it was good. And that, and that experience was from... My dad, um, we did uh, heaps of developing of the Cavity Coast, and so we knew what we were in for. Um, 
incidentally, the peat was maximum depth was about six metres deep, and um, so we we dug most of it out. There was only one area where we preloaded, which was um, where we left some peat in and went over the top of it. Um, but yeah, predominantly we dug the whole lot out, um, and it's a solid foundation down to the iron sand down the bottom, or it's a pe- hard pan um, sand, and um, but a lot of water, so you've got to deal with the incoming water. So, yeah, it was a great job, um, good people, and and uh, five minutes from home, so you couldn't ask for better, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I suppose another one, um, Stan, that's sort of not too far from home is, is the Transmission Gully um, project, and, and obviously our listeners would be well aware of, of this project. It's been uh, talked about for many, many years, um, and it's been in the media again more recently um, following its successful opening, and you've been heavily involved with the project through Goodman's. Um, yeah. And it's had you know lots of high publicised lows and and highs as well. Yep. Um, tell us a bit about that, and I suppose you know you know getting involved with that, and and yeah. I suppose at the end of the day it was was well worth being involved from a Goodwin's perspective. But yeah, good to get oh. your perspective there. Oh yeah. Um, so originally we we couldn't do much because we were still being uh, pretty tied up with Mackay's to pick picker. So uh, they did get me involved early on for a bit of advice. And um, one thing I said to the Australians is that. Um, there's one thing that's different in New Zealand to Australia, and, and they said, what's that? I said, water runs uphill, and they, <laughs> they, they couldn't believe it. They go, what are you talking about? I said, well, I guarantee you, you go to the top of one of those hills, there'll be water coming out of it. And, um, and sure enough, the saddle, top of the saddle, which is the highest point, it was just water coming out everywhere. And in actual fact, when it rains, um, those water shoots off the top are going to look like Niagara Falls. It's unreal. Um, so, yeah, but uh, I drove through it, completed job this morning, first time uh, as an open road, and um, it was impressive. It's a great road. Um, there's definitely some highs and lows on the way through. I, I've got to say the highs were um, our contract works. Um, they were really easy contracts for us. Um, they ran them well. Uh, there was an Irishman running them, actually, which was bloody good. We, we, <laughs> we had trouble with a with a pipeline at one stage and, and the engineer was um, failing the backfill and, and I'd already taken a shovel out and I knew it was as hard as the Hobbs Hill and and um, so I went and saw Michael, Michael Dowling his name was, and a and good fella, hard man uh, but fair and uh, so I said, Michael, got a problem, they want me to rip this backfill out. I said, you got five minutes? He said, sure, you know, so I, so I took him out and I got out, and the first thing I gave him was a shovel. <laughs> and I said, well, you're an Irishman. You should have been born with a shovel in your hand. <laughs> so I said, you dig that. Tell me that's failed. And uh, he got into it. He said, there's nothing wrong with that. I said, oh, I know. And uh, so, and that, and that was the good thing about it. He, he dealt with it. He's, he um, went back through the, the process and said, carry on. And I said, excellent. That's great. <laughs> uh, but overall... Um, some really good people in there. Um, probably the lows were some hold-ups, consenting hold-ups, and also chasing money was always a bit of a problem. But uh, we managed to sort that out in the end. And so, But um, the, probably the other hardest thing to deal with was the plant hire side of it, because um, generally we always do contracting. But the plant hire meant that we sent machines and men, and they were out of our control, and... Um, so we were um, really relying on the people running the job, um, which, which wasn't us in, in that situation, to uh, manage the earthworks and look after the machinery in, in terms of where it, w- where it was working and what it was capable of doing. And I think, you know, as Kiwis, we're used to working in the steep. I think as Australians, that a lot of them were used to working on the flat and... Um, there's a big difference when you put a man up on the top of 200 metre high cut and uh, compared to having him on the flat ground and um, that that was really quite obvious. So a lot of, you know, that was hard to deal with for us but yeah, we got there and, and as I say, they've done a great job, it looks good. Yeah, it would have been great um, heading through there this morning, like you say, and and seeing the finished finished project. What were um, what were some of the I suppose the key machines for you in that particular project that uh, were there yeah. for I suppose key parts of that? Yeah, um, oh, definitely the highlight was the brand new six thirty seven Ks. Like they arrived and everyone just 
sort of took a big breath and and um, and we, the 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 poor case they they arrived on the job and virtually we put them straight to work and literally we were loading down about a one and a half to one grade um, so they were virtually fully loaded as they hopped off the edge of the rock and straight <laughs> and and we were going straight down and so much so that we had to modify the front of their aprons to stop the dirt coming over and landing on the cab. It was that steep, and the the rocks were rolling out under the wheels, and um, beating us down the hill. So, you, and you, you couldn't even drive a dozer back up where we were going down. Um, and and then we, um, yeah, we joined uh, with some Webcos in the background as well. So we had two Webcos working the two five twos, and uh, the two six thirty seven Ks, and and um, it was a phenomenal job, it was called Cut 40 which was down towards the Pororo end of the job and I think one of the reasons we might have got that was because it was so steep um, we we couldn't even get the dumpers out of the gullies on their own um, we had to hook a D6 on to pull the dumpers out of the gullies, it was um, it was pretty horrendous and very narrow and heaps of water divisions uh, it, was, it was real tricky it, 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 Certainly wore a few of the guys out, there, but they they were into it, you know. And we had a fantastic team led by my brother and uh, Nigel Fraser, who's one of my schoolmates actually. And um, his father was in in um, forestry, and his boys worked for us as well. So we had um, we had the Fraser team down there as well, which was fantastic, and uh, just made a heck of a difference having a good team, you know. So. Yeah, it sounds like it was pretty challenging, and to have those good people there um, certainly makes a lot, a lot of difference, that's yeah, for sure. Yeah. And Stan, you sort of, um, as far as Goodman goes, the, the first thing that comes to mind is you guys operating in um, interesting and, and challenging conditions. I remember one of the first things in my career when I, I started in Wellington was heading out to the Macra Wind Farm project, and sort yeah. of the conditions on the site there in the early days were sort of quite interesting. So I suppose, you know, if we touch on wind farms, these projects are, are generally built in pretty rugged environments. They're not known for their good weather conditions and stuff like that. How do they sort of influence and, and I suppose what are some of the lessons you've learned from there? Yeah, well, we, we learned a massive lesson. Uh, we, we, uh, David Rubery worked for Higgins and Higgins got us involved in um, Tearpity, which was the first big wind farms, Meridian Wind Farm in, in Palmerston North. And we were one of four earth moving contractors on the site, and I can't remember that how much volume we did, but it might have been half a million cubes or something like that. And um, anyway, it was February two thousand and four, supposed to be our best time to shift dirt. February, I can tell you now, it rained every day in February, and we got nine hundred and eighty mil of rain in one month. That's like equivalent of the whole of Wellington's rain in one month. Um, it, it got so bad it washed the bridge out to the site, and which was the main road, and we had to fly the guys home. Um, we had a helicopter business at the time. By the way, don't get into helicopters, they're very expensive to run. <laughs> <laughs> Worse than earth moon gear, but anyway, we uh, we managed to fly the guys home, and we had to fly them back and forward uh, to, to and from work for a whole week because the whole man or two was shut, basically, and... Um, we got called down to the river down the bottom to stop the railway bridge getting washed away because uh, debris had built up in front of the railway bridge. Um, so, yeah, the, the challenge was huge, and the guys just jumped to it. They, I mean, some of them literally didn't go home. They stayed on site in one of the huts, and, and um, uh, it just rained. And at the same time, uh, we were doing Kaitoki Hill in Wellington and by, above the Timaru Lakes, and... Once again, that that was the weather just hit that, and we just about watched the hill come down in front of us by <laughs> by its own, you know. Um, so yeah, we certainly learnt some lessons about the weather, and never underestimate that the fact that it's summer and you might you, you think you're going to have a good run, but uh, you know we certainly didn't. Yeah, yeah. I think especially um, resonates having good land cruisers as well on a lot of those sites. Um, <laughs> One of the good memories because you can yeah. get in and out nicely. Yeah, yeah, we uh, we love the Land Cruisers. Uh, Toyota's been a big thing in the company. Um, Dad had a a brand new FJ40 in 1973, and that and that was a three speed 
um, FJ40. And then um, he bought another one in 1976. And I bought it off him in uh, 1986 and had probably done about a million Ks by then. <laughs> and, uh, and anyway, uh, ever since then, I, I it was... It became my family car for a while, and then it was my work car, and then I um, changed it into an off-roader. So uh, she's, I've still got it, actually, so it's still in the family. So <laughs> how's that? <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, we'll get into um, some of the off-roading a little bit later on, but um, Stan, you mentioned, I suppose, um, as part of the, the Transmission Gully project um, and also the, the previous project as well with um, the motor scrapers. Um, yeah. yeah. And I suppose you're well known for your love of motor scrapers. Mm. Um, where do you think that comes from? And and do you have a favourite model? You, you mentioned the the, the Cat six three seven K motor scraper before, but um, is there a is there another favourite model there? And oh, look, look, I started driving the Triple One A Wabco, which was electric steer, electric elevators, uh, four cylinder um, uh, 4B, uh, 471, and um, uh, I just loved it. I couldn't wait to hear it start up in the morning, and and um, I polished it, looked after it, and and the worst thing was having to go back to school. I didn't want to do that. I just wanted to stay on a scraper. And um, the thing about a motor scraper is that you can do a whole job yourself. I mean, Dad left me on a job. Uh, I had to dig a lake and um, build a, a retaining wall, sort of a bund around the outside and compact it. I did the whole thing by myself and um, the only bit I had trouble with was I had to um, open up the old lake to the new lake and there was a narrow causeway and I thought I could I could do it. I thought I'll be able to be able to cut the causeway out and let the water through. Well I, I got I got to the stage of letting the water through and then I got stuck and then I was stranded like a like a <laughs> I mean, a tortoise sitting on the <laughs> I had to get a hand out there. Dad said, what the hell are you doing? I said, well, I wanted to do the, finish the whole job and let the water through. And he said, you're never going to get through there, <laughs> you know. So anyway, uh, lessons learnt. I was only 15. Um, yeah, but I suppose uh, the, the actual best scraper that um, I've got, uh, to be honest, is the, the triple three um, FT. Um, we've got the later model, the 353 FT, um, but it's not as comfortable as the old 333. The 637s are fantastic, of course, because they're um, new and, and you don't need earmuffs, and um, and uh, they've got all the mod cons and they're comfortable. Um, but I, I've still got a real affiliation to the old Webco's, and, and um, they've they're certainly got um, power-to-weight ratio um, is right up there and in actual fact um, working them at, um, up on the Manitou Gorge we, we can see that the cats pull away a bit more climbing the hill empty um, but the Webcos catch them up on the on the loading, the elevator because they, they're loading the material wind quicker and so we, we're still doing load for load um, with a brand new motor scraper and um, uh, so it's pretty impressive really I think um, you know uh, we're wearing cutting edges out. We're only we're doing a hundred hours, and we're wearing cutting edges out. We have to drag our bowls down the hill because it's so steep. You can't rely on the retarders, or and you different don't use the brake pedal. That would burn them out in about five seconds flat. But uh, yeah, but anyway, it's uh, great fun. So the uh, motor scrapers, my view, are the number one machine for shifting dirt. Short haul, you know, you, you can't beat them. Yeah. Yeah, they're definitely very impressive to watch, especially when you've got a fleet um, yep. all going at one time, and, and it's amazing watching just how quickly landscapes change and, and stuff like that. Yeah, so. yeah. But yep. away from motor scrapers, you guys have still got a, a massive fleet of, of differing machines with different technology sort of attached and integrated and stuff like that. So, yep. what's some of your your favourite or um, other machines that you find incredible to or fantastic to help you in, in the job site? Oh yeah, you can't beat the D10. That's <laughs> when you <laughs> when you got a bit of something to shift and get it out of the way quickly. You you hop on that. And um, but actually, the favourite bulldozer would have to be probably the D9T because it's so um, so versatile and we've got GPS on it. So you you can you can just go straight into the cut and fix problems up. Uh, you can you can still rip uh, hard rock with it 
it's um, very productive dozer and it and it behaves like a D8. You know, it's so nimble. Um, you wouldn't believe that a 55 ton bulldozer is as as nimble as it is. You know, so um, it's definitely dozers are the second best thing. Uh, Diggers, diggers are okay, but if I get bored on a digger. I don't. I don't think. I never think I'm doing enough. <laughs> enough work. <laughs> yeah. So, just with that in mind, and you sort of you touched on the D9 and sort of GPS and stuff. How have you yeah. found the integration of technologies and, and what you guys do now? Yeah. Oh, fantastic. So we made the decision in um, 2000. We were sticking with Trimble. We used to, we had Leica before that. Um, so glad we did because now with Caterpillar being integrated with Trimble, the machines can come out of the factory ready. We, you know, there's nothing worse than seeing a brand spanking new machine getting ripped apart and cables putting in. Um, but when it's done at the factory, um, you know, you just know it's right. There's no screws through the earth wire or something like that, and it just it, or power wire, and, and just the problems are ironed out. Um, before we even get them. Um, and the GPS technology now, I mean, every new machine we just that, that's got a blade or a bucket or a cutting edge all, all have GPS on them. We just order it from the factory. Um, we're still retrofitting some of the older machines. We've got, I think, uh, three of the Webco scrapers we've got GPS on um, and just about every digger. Um, we just we just live with it now, and and we actually feel naked when you don't have it. <laughs> it's a bizarre, but uh, it, it comes at a huge cost though. Um, and one day it'll be real cheap, but at the moment it's still an expensive um, item. And and I think a lot of companies have the trouble to to decide whether it's worth it or not. Um, for us, it became a no-brainer. Uh, just we just don't have pegs on the site, and since. 2000, um, we've actually been going pegless, which um, which is amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some really good insight, I suppose, into the technology and how that's assisted over the last few years. And and I suppose you know your insight in terms of the, how those machines um, you know continue to assist your business and you know mm. even some of those older ones that you know you've retrofitted. Yeah, um, yeah. Some really good insight there. I suppose outside of work-related machines. Um, you're also well-known for your passion for off-road 4x4 racing. Yeah, yeah. Um, tell us a bit about that and, and when did you get involved and, and tell us a bit more about it for those people that might not know what it is. Well, um, I guess if I go back to the start, uh, Lance, my brother and myself, we bought Dad's original 1973 Land Cruiser as well and we, uh, we started trialling in 1980. Would have been about 84 or 85, I think. And um, and most people would have seen the trials, the Suzuki Extreme Challenge on TV and stuff like that, where you go through the pegs. And we did that right up until the 90s when kids came along and uh, life started getting a bit more serious. So we, we sort of parked those up for a bit. But I still carried on um, with the club trips and this sort of thing until about 2000 and six when I got the urge to go back to competition stuff again and um, winch comps were, were just uh, starting out really they'd been going for a while but they were really starting to grow so I got the old Orange Land Cruiser the 1976 one and kitted that up um, it had a PTO winch in the front and geared it all up and started winch comps and the Rotorua winch challenge was the first one and from then on I was hooked because uh, you had to as every hazard was against the clock, and uh, you had to really think. Uh, you have to plan with your mate. You, you get one of your best mates to be the runner because he's got to be fit, and you, <laughs> all you've got to do is drive. But uh, hey, and, and you, you have to, you know, think ahead, plan to get the right tree. You're not allowed to walk the hazard to start with, so you got no idea what you're in for, apart from all the other competitors saying, oh, watch that tree or watch that hill or it's, shit, you roll over backwards there. And, <laughs> and that, so you get you get nervous before you even start because everyone's sort of warning you up and you think, oh, no, what are we in for in here? But uh, that's so good. Yeah, um, and when you've got that winch rope on and you're going up a vertical bank, feels vertical, probably isn't quite, but... Um, there's nothing better than knowing you got that rope on the front of you. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. 
Uh, and so we carried on from there. And then um, I was beating my old 40 series Land Cruiser up a bit much, so I was had an opportunity to get an um, off-road vehicle from England. And so just before COVID, actually, I flew over to England and arrived there in a wonder. And Jim Marsden, the guy is famous all over the world for... Um, winning in Europe for the Ultra 4 stuff and the winch comps and so I arranged to meet up with Jim and I got there and arrived expecting to see the wagon ready to go but uh, it was a chassis on the floor and, <laughs> and the wheels were over there and the diff was <laughs> diff was in another shed and the motor was out the back and I thought oh man this is interesting I wonder how long it's going to take to put this together next thing Jim's mates arrive Within three days, it was all back together, and I drove it around his yard, and I was sold on it. <laughs> you, you wouldn't believe it. Um, and uh, that was a fantastic trip. We came home, put it, we put on the boat, and took it took about four months to get here, I think. But uh, what a machine! And then COVID hit, and you wouldn't believe it. I couldn't race so it. Was uh, it was just uh, one of those things. But um, when we could race it, uh, what a machine! She's um, she's a uh, I've uh, got an LSX 454. It's called Little Lady, but it isn't a little lady. It's a little angry lady. That's what it is. It, it's, uh, it's, got a, it's got an LSX 454, which is 650 horse. Um, it's got um, American diffs, so called spider. Uh, it's got spider track axles, uh, gearwork stuffs, and um, they're like a worm wheel. They're not like a conventional diff. It, its axles are about the same size as a D8 axle. They're, they're huge. Everything's heavy about it. Weighs two and a half ton, but it, man, it performs like um, like a race car. She's she's uh, awesome. So I, I I just hooked on it. I love it. That's what I what I love doing. People say you're crazy. You get covered in dirt at work, and you get covered in dirt in your play <laughs> as well. I just uh, can't help it. It's just uh, I think it stems right back from travelling with Dad um, off road every day. You know. And uh, Dad was well known for towing trailers everywhere, and on the jobs in the dust and and in the mud, and and it was a challenge just getting home, you know. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Well, tell us a wee bit about um, how the since you've had the the little lady, the yeah. little angry yeah. lady. Yeah. Um, tell us a wee bit about how the results have been since uh, you know you've had the oh. opportunity to to race that oh. over the last sort of eighteen or so months. Oh yeah, well. Um, I was renowned for getting third in the old 40 series. I could never quite get to the top. Well, I, I did get to the top a few times, but it was really tough. And um, since I got little lady, I think the first comp I got second, and and then basically since then I've been um, right on top of the game. Um, and uh, certainly, people say, oh, it's not about the machine, but in this case, it is. She's a she's a weapon, and. Uh, I think any one of the top drivers in the competition, if they got a chance to drive it, they'd come out on top as well. She, she makes you look good, um, and it definitely helps. She's that, so much power, and it's got two. Um, so the giggle pin winches are electric, but the the whole machine runs on 24 volts, so it feeds 24 volt through 12 volt electric winches. And yeah, man, they they light up. Uh, so she, the giggle pin winches. So Jim. Uh, Mars and I mentioned before he he makes the giggle pin winch and um, it's a fantastic uh, double draw. Uh, it's got double engine um, uh, motors on it and uh, super powerful and super quick. Um, so I can't say enough about it. You know, it's just uh, every time you start it up, you get that tingle down your spine. You know, like it's just like the day I started first motor scrap. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Certainly sounds like a lot of fun. That's for yeah, sure. Yeah. So Stan, sort of, um, through a lot of the, the episodes that we've had so far, I think one of the, the biggest things that we've sort of seen and speaking to people is having that work-life balance, having hobbies and, and things like that. For you, what do you think is probably the biggest success in the way the, the business has succeeded and stuff like that? Is it the family atmosphere, hobbies on the outside, or, or what do you think it is? Oh, oh yeah, well, um, it's people by far. So... Um the best people and the families that we've employed, um, they're just huge. Uh, so um, right back from the start, um, I mean, we grew up with um, the Morgans. So Dave Morgan worked for Dad for, I think, before he died, it was up to about 50 years uh, working for my dad. And um, his family, uh, cousins, brothers, 
sons, uh, nephews, um, all carried on working for us. And um, I think it's the people that you employ um, that make the difference. Um, we've had, uh, so the Morgans, the Hope Harpers, the Barretts, the Phillips, the Dornbushes, the Joneses, uh, the Kings, Manfields, Coopers, Duncans, um, just the, the, the list of families go on and, and some of them are third generation um, now. Um, so um, also, I think the, the human resources team that select, well, like we don't do the interviews anymore, um, they, they do an exceptional job. So they know the type of people that it takes to, to work in our industry and um, they know that you, you need to have a certain sort of skill level, but it's not the end, the end of it we can train train that into some people but they do have to have have the willingness to want to sit on machinery you know and um, not everyone's got that uh, but um, you get someone with uh, usually they get a little bit of mongrel in them and then they make a real good operator you know <laughs> that's that's sort of it um, but you've got to have the right attitude yeah yeah I think the um, sort of a, a reoccurring theme that uh, you know we've been hearing is it's, it comes down to the people um, yep. And the people that uh, you work with certainly make make the industry and, and certainly make the companies that are within the industry successful. Yep. So, yeah. Um, so I suppose following on from that sort of theme, in terms of you know the business and the industry, what's the um, what's the biggest challenge that you think that you've got you know in business right now, and how do you think you'll overcome it? You know, moving forward. Oh yeah. Um, so COVID. Is definitely affecting us. We we seem to have about ten percent of our workforce off at any one time, and um, that seems to be ongoing. I, I hope that it finishes soon because uh, it's just just a nightmare. Um, and fuel um, fuel's just killing us at the moment. So um, interesting thing is, you know, um, we've had a few meetings with Walker Cote, and you know they say, when, when are you going to get electric machinery? And I said, well, when Caterpillar makes it, but you know, at the moment, at the moment, uh, I said, we're the tail wagging the dog, and um, uh, you know, I, I don't think I see. I think you can buy a one and a half ton digger, but it ain't going to do much, and and um, you know, we just don't have that opportunity. Um, I said, the best chance we've got is that they'll do hydrogen conversions for diesel engines, and, and that that could be still a, a fair way away. But um, I can't see how we're going to get full electric. We, we've got diesel electric. We've got a D7E. Um, we've got the Wabco. So they're diesel electric. They've got electric elevators um, powered, powered by um, diesel up the front, of course. But interesting enough, Latorno, who he was the founder of Earth Moving Equipment, really, RG Latorno, uh, who sold to Wabco, um, he... He had invented electric drive uh, machinery well early in the 60s, and even he even had um, pantographs on the top of the dumpers so that on a um, consistent haul out of a quarry, you could set up a power wire, and you'd drive under the power wire, the pantograph would hit the power wire, and you'd be able to take your diesel engine back to idle, and you'd carry on up the hill. Yeah, this is 60s technology I'm talking here, and... We can't seem to get our act together to even sort something like that out. Uh, so we're, we're miles off it. Um, you know, I, we're, we're actually um, travelling along with the blinkers on. I think even in, as, as we are today, the carbon footprint and when you buy machinery, we made a conscious decision to buy the Tier 4 final machines, which is Ed Blue. It, it's um, it's more expensive, obviously. It's got more maintenance, um, but it is carbon friendly. But I don't think people at the top actually understand because we can still buy tier zero machines if we want right now. There's no no restriction on us. Um, so if they were really serious about carbon, they'd be um, saying, right, there's no more old machinery unless it's vintage coming in. It, it all has to be tier four final, you know, and the, the um, powers that be haven't caught on yet so and yet now they want us to get electric and we don't have electric so it's, it's not in our industry yet and and if it is it's um, only a baby you know so you can't do anything with that 
Yeah. Yeah, certainly an ongoing challenge um, yep. within the industry at the moment, that's for sure. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, we sort of talked about um, some of the challenges earlier on with some projects and, and of course, some successes as part of that. Um, I suppose on the other end, the end of it, you've got, you know, some some failures, you know, everyone sort of makes yeah. mistakes in, in yeah. business. Is there anything that um, sort of sticks out on that side and was the, you know, some lessons learnt from that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we, we, we've had a few of those. <laughs> we, <laughs> yeah, we, probably the biggest one was, um, well, we were at Rata to Silver Hope, which is um, up just south of um, Hunterville, and we did a big CSP culvert. We, we built it ourselves. It was aluminium an egg-shaped culvert and done a great job of it, bolted it all together, lifted it all in, put the metal in, um, backfilled around it. We were in the process of building the head walls and we also had the subgrade going on on the top and Higgins had done the prep for the road. And it was weekend and there was a bit of a fresh coming through and we'd sandbagged up the head walls and everything and um, we came to work on Monday morning and just couldn't believe it. The whole thing had imploded. It had just self collapsed We were driving a load of motor scrapers over it the week before, and um, uh, it was just devastating. <laughs> it was a, a $300,000 culvert, and it just just it was a pile of rubbish in the bottom of the gully with water running through it, but, <laughs> but a, a collapsed road on top of it. And um, I'll tell you one thing, that... Um, uh, insurance comes into play, but um, but because it wasn't our fault, um, and they couldn't prove negligence on, on anything we'd done, insurance didn't want to pay, and so um, then all of a sudden everyone goes, well, who's going to pay? And um, it took a long time to sort that out. Um, fortunately, we had some really good um, engineers on the job that that. Um, sort of supported us and then actually we managed to re-divert the stream and in the end we didn't even put the stream through where the culvert went in, we bypassed it and ran it under the bridge which was only 100 metres further up the road and it was a good solution, in fact made you think why didn't they do that in the first place but um, yeah, the the culvert, um, that gave us a lesson in insurance and it gave us a lesson in durability of products, we we thought we had something that was strong but but it wasn't, um, and um, and in your quality controls, we, we had all the testing, we had all the photographs, the, the measuring, the um, survey, you had to measure the um, inside of the shape of it when you were building it, so you didn't get it out of shape and everything like that, we had all that, um, it was just um, uh, when the water pressure came up, it, it was there was a problem with the overall design of it and it just um, the water pressure is an amazing thing it it put pressure on where it shouldn't have and it just imploded it Um, so that was a big lesson and and changed the way we sort of uh, did a few jobs Um, and then there's there's been other lessons as well Um, not to price something too cheap because that really bites you (laughs) we did did 5,000 cubes of um, gabion rock uh, Gabion baskets, that's 5,000 of those baskets and I priced the, them too cheap and every basket was painful. <laughs> <laughs> You'd have been counting those to the end probably. <laughs> you don't want to do that too often. Yeah, but no, good though. We learn from it, you know. I suppose that's always the most important thing, isn't it? So. Mm, yeah, yeah. So I suppose that sort of resonates when you, you look at failures and how that leads to successes in the future, you know, you sort of touched on the fact that you, um, you're you not going to underprice stuff or, or you're very conscious about that sort of thing. So what are some of the other great successes or even um, sort of inspirational or things that you look at now and you go, actually, that was that was cutting edge and we did really well with that and sort of what drives you to succeed and, and do those sorts of things in the future? Yeah, well, I think, I think um, the GPS has definitely made... Um, a change in the way we do things because um, we're even now doing as building for payment purposes through the the GPS um, checking on that we've you know dug things in the right place uh, that we've um, you know we're building to specification and and uh, that's that's probably the biggest change. Um, there's lots of inspirational people that I've worked with that uh, have have changed the way. 
I thought about doing things and even, you know, um, my dad was obviously one of those people, um, but there's numerous others, as Vic Draper, Jay McJoro, or John McJoro as well, Jay's dad, um, Kerry McClinchy, um, uh, John Walsh, they're all Wellington contractors, and they were well known. Um, but I'll, I'll never forget John McJoro. I turned up, I was doing soil testing at the time, I was a young engineer, because I, I didn't work for Dad straight after school. Dad said all of us kids weren't working in earth moving and we had to go and do our own thing. And I became a civil engineer and I was, I was doing soil testing. I was on an earthworks job and it was a McJoro's job. And I, I turned up there and I was having a cup of tea with the guys at seven in the morning and we were yakking as you do. And, and John turned up. And man alive, did I get a dressing down. He thought I was holding him up. They were actually holding me up. <laughs> and I, and I, yes, John, yes, sorry about that. I, I won't do that again. I've never, ever, ever had a cup of tea with the guys ever again. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they're the lessons that you learn and you think, oh, you know, you won't do that again. Um, and But, yeah, and John Walsh too, you know, Irishman, train la, tough man, um, Hard man, but knew how to put pipes in and knew how to get the guys working, and um, and you didn't want to be uh, underpaying him either. You, you, you knew all about it, um, but yeah, that was uh, certainly. Um, and watching Vic Draper um, finish his jobs with with a bulldozer, you know, he could do anything. Now everything's done with a digger, but in those days, the majority was done with a bulldozer and. Um, uh, if Vic couldn't do it with a dozer, it couldn't be done, you know. He he was amazing to watch. So they're the lessons you learn and you remember. Yeah. I suppose that's where you see it goes to succeed and, and gives you the ability to succeed in, in business, is watching others and seeing how they do it. Yep. So where do you sort of see the future taking both yourself? Obviously, I can imagine there's a, a bit more um, off-roading and four-wheel driving, as well as um, where do you see Goodman's future sort of going to as well? Oh, look, it's hard to tell. Um, I, I'd still like to keep doing the roads. I think we we build some good roads and um, we're saving lives. I know we're saving lives. You look at Transmission Gully, that's, that's going to save lives. It's saving time, making New Zealand productive. Um, I think what I'd really like to to get uh, be able to win the um, Otaki to Levin job. That'd be another one close to home. Um uh, we did the Furukino trestle bridge with um, Brian Perry's. That was a good job, and that's at the north end. We did Mackay's to Peak at the south end. Um, we're doing Peak Peak at Otaki at the moment with Fletcher's. So if I can do that link, I'd be able to sort of close the chapter. But that's never a given, you know. So we've got to put our best foot forward and uh, see how we go. Um, I, I think we, we, one thing that my dad always said is stick to your knitting and. Um, we, we all like doing what we're doing. Um, we try to make work a fun place. It, it gets a bit serious at times, but uh, we try to try to keep it as simple as we can. Um, we do have a lot of systems, but we need them these days. Um, and we're tr- trying to get rid of paper. I, I hate paper, so uh, everything's on, on apps. Um, so if we can... Get rid of paper and get stuff instantaneous. We're getting some really good results um, back on quantities shifted every day um, through our apps, and um, it's really coming into its own on the Manor Two Gorge. That's, by the way, is another fantastic job. Um, that's a brilliant job to have not too far from home, and um, it's basically six million cubes and eleven kilometres of of road. So. It's a huge dirt moving job. Um, more so, in fact, that you know, Transmission Gully was about eight million cubes, but it was over twenty seven kilometres long. Well, we're six million cubes over eleven k long. So, just to give you an idea what sort of volumes we're shifting. Um, we're we're twenty five thousand cubes every day. Um, so, in a good week, we had um, our best week. I think was one hundred and thirty seven thousand cubes I think so far um, so yeah and how um, how much longer has that project got to go Stan? It, um, we've got to open it December 2024 so the pressure's on oh the time is ticking <laughs> then, isn't it <laughs> yeah pressure's on yep yep thanks Stan for coming on Breaking Ground it's been really great chatting with you today and thanks so much to our listeners we hope you've enjoyed today's conversation with Stan and, and um, 
and got uh, got some good insights out of it. So we'd love your feedback. To get in touch, you can send us a message for, through any one of our TerraCat social media channels. And please keep an eye out for our TerraCat Facebook page for details about next month's Breaking Ground episode. Thank you very much, Stan, and uh, goodbye. Yeah, cheers, Marty. Thanks, Richard. Awesome. Thank you.